Okay, so here is class 15, clutches, brakes, couplings, and flywheels. This is uh, chapter 16. And these all, what they have in common is they all rotate, pretty much. That's the big thing that they have in common. We're most interested in, um, in this topic. The, the things that interest us are the actuating force that needs to uh, be applied um, that's most often in uh, brakes, uh, that we need to put some kind of force in there. Um, the torque that's transmitted uh, between uh, by the brake, um, but also through the clutch um, and through couplings and uh, uh, flywheels and the energy loss uh, due to brakes and some due to clutch. And um, also the temperature rise. Now the temperature rise, we, don't, we, we can't really do a very good job actually of uh, predicting the actual temperature rise. Uh, when, we, when we get to that, we'll see there's some uh, uh, difficulties there. And I wore a funny hat to make it even better, make, make the video better, yeah. So um, to get a little specific here into the different kinds, uh, some of these, uh, these are topics covered in Shigley. Uh, these figures come from another book, uh, the publisher or, or the editor is Collins. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Ghosh used to use Collins before, uh, several years ago, but then they switched over to Shigley. Uh, so we can have an internal dr shoe drum brake, and the important thing here is that the drum uh, rotates, right? So um, it's kind of hard to picture maybe, but the drum is connected somehow uh, to uh, a shaft. Okay, so the drum looks, you know, something like that. It's got a thin wall to it, and it rotates, and then somewhere back behind the thing, uh, it's connected to a shaft that's uh, uh, that's uh, um, that's spinning. Um, so it's the uh, whatever's connected to that drum somewhere behind there that you're not seeing is the thing that we're actually breaking. And this has pads, this has shoes on the inside. We call these shoes. And uh, connect, and they're pivoted, so it's connected someplace, and uh, that's going to be stationary here. So the the drums uh, um, actually uh, uh, do. Uh, um, so so actually, the other part can also rotate. So the drum could be the stationary part uh, as well. And um, but uh, the the, uh, the the pins right here are connected to something. Uh, either the thing that's rotating or the thing that's stationary. Uh, you, you'll see a drum brake, internal shoe drum brakes, in older models of um, muscle cars and that kind of thing. Uh, most often they're going to be disc brakes uh, in newer vehicles, but uh, you'll still run across some that they, I believe they have shoes. But the the uh, important thing uh, in that's driving this is this brake pad uh, that's on there, and that's some kind of material right here that's going to wear away, by the way, um, and it causes friction is the main driver of these, right? So uh, that's the thing we want to care about, and there's some kind of actuating force. In this case, it's a hydraulic cylinder that's pushing evenly and pushing these shoes up against against that drum, which causes the friction, which causes it to stop. We could also have an external um, shoe drum brake right here. So in this case, we have this on a lever right here, and here's the shoe. And by the way, uh, we want to make this designation. This is a short shoe as compared, compared to a long shoe. And a short shoe is usually something that's less than 90 degrees of an arc along the, uh, the drum. Uh, and so this is a rim drum I right hear and this thing is spinning and we're going to try to stop it and this is like really sort of an old timey uh, type of way. Uh, another old type timey uh, uh, means of applying a brake is a band brake. And so this is could be, well, you can think of it as leather. It could be metal and it, it does have um, a, 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 a like a breaking material on the inside. So you see right here, there's there's like a gray right here. And that's the material that's actually um, causing the uh, uh, friction against the, um, the thing that's rotating and uh, causing it to break. We can also have clutches, and they're very similar to brakes in that they they rely on friction to be able to uh, uh, m make one thing uh, the same speed as the other. In this case, in a clutch, there's usually something that's rotating, and you want it to engage with something else and make it rotate at the same. So, and and hopefully there's no slip um, while it's engaged, but there can be, 
right? But but we want them to actually uh, uh, have enough friction there so the shafts, as they uh, um, virtually become connected, and it kind of turns into a coupling as soon as uh, we, we've applied an actuating force to get them to... Uh, uh, coincide and get them to be the same speed. And that's uh, true also with a cone clutch as opposed to a disc clutch. Um, the, the cone now has like a taper to it and so they get, when this thing gets pushed towards there with some type of actuator, um, the friction acts between uh, these two uh, uh, cones that are nested in front of each other. And that friction material in there is going to be the thing that uh, causes them to uh, eventually rotate at the same speed. Similar to the disc clutch is the disc brake, and it's one of the most common brakes there are now on cars and trucks. And we have pads um, on each side of this disc, and they're pinched together and form and, and cause the disc to uh, uh, slow down and stop. And these things have in common is, is friction is the main the, is rotation and friction is what they have in common. Um, so right here, here's a, a schematic of a car, and and this was true for some many years of muscle cars where they would have disc brakes on in the front and drum brakes in the rear here. So the, where you could see, um, and and some of you probably have actually worked on brakes and done a brake job where you replace the shoes on these most often and uh, or brake pads, I should say. And you might also take the disc and um, sometimes you might bring it to a machine shop. You might even have done it yourself where you put it on a lathe and you get the, uh, you, you can uh, uh, take off a little piece because these tend to get warped a little bit. And uh, there's a, a little bit of margin where uh, that, that you can have uh, before you have to have them replaced where you can actually uh, um, uh, get them, uh, uh, I want to say straightened out. No, that's not right. You, you could get them uh, uh, to get the warping out of them. Um, so, but also you might uh, replace the pads in here. Um, and, and you'll notice that the, 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 these, the, the brake pads will actually wear down and there'll be like uh, dust uh, from them. It's kind of a nasty, uh, messy job there. And uh, they're showing the hydraulic interconnection right here where we have this uh, a vacuum booster pump right here. And there's a, a brake fluid reservoir and a master cylinder. And it distributes out to, uh, to, to the brakes and tries to keep them uh, even. Uh, more modern systems uh, have a much more complicated layout because uh, we're trying to uh, keep all the uh, uh, distribute that braking force uh, uh, evenly as you can and also uh, to, to prevent anti-lock. So uh, brakes are pretty important part and a pretty complicated thing. And the reason why I included it in this uh, topic is actually I wanted to incorporate a brake in our project, um, part the, the part two of our project. Um, for the hoist to because uh, because we have a motor and gears and uh, it's driving a, a pulley but we want to be able to have some kind of control over that and we also want to make it stop you know and turn the motor off and still be able to kind of hold the load um, friction is it plays an important part in these brakes and clutches so the friction material itself is something we, we want to have a, um, some good properties right we don't need a, a good coefficient of friction uh, it needs to withstand a, a pretty high amount of pressure uh, be able to stand um, a pretty good amount of temperature as well right so we, we don't want the thing burning up and bursting into flames and so some materials have better um, properties uh, uh, this combination of properties that can handle things well and uh, so table um, 16.3 talks about the, uh, well present some and you'll notice I've highlighted them in yellow asbestos for many many years was the uh, the go-to material and um, asbestos is pretty amazing stuff uh, it's got that nasty side benefit uh, uh, that it causes mesothelioma and cancer and uh, one of my uh, important people in my life Bill McCarthy he, he, he was the mentor that I had the first uh, uh, big boss that I had in my first job and and in my second job and my third no I guess my third job and my fifth job yeah okay um, at Seaworthy Systems, he was the uh, vice president in charge of engineering, and I worked closely with him, and he was a great guy, but he, he passed away from mesothelioma um, because of asbestos exposure he got during Vietnam on board merchant ships. Um, so anyway, uh, it's, 
the book goes through, and I don't know what, if it's the greatest example, but I'll me I'll mention this. It goes through an example of a doorstop, and um, the big takeaway from this, right, as you're, you might want to go through, is that we see that it's um, uh, the, the idea here, the, the the important idea, is that there's going to be some pressure that's being applied inside the friction surface and that friction the way that it's distributed we don't really know right it's it would be very difficult to get like sensors in there and get a really good idea of how that pressure was distributed but we kind of need to know that in order to integrate across that face in the interface and try to figure out what that uh, a normal force is going to be and if we can get that of course it's changing throughout the thing if we can get that normal force we can get the friction force and we could predict what the stopping power uh, stopping power I was it's stopping torque quite often is what it's going to be um, we can figure out how that's going to f uh, function so here right here you'll see there's the cross section of the interface right there and you'll see that the pressure has been placed in here and so it, because we don't really know the pressure distribution we have to make some kind of like model uh, decision and so many of the things that you're going to see in this chapter is really um, trying to use a uh, assumed model that's been shown maybe over time empirically to be a decent predictor of what that pressure distribution is that allows us to uh, calculate uh, the, the brake's uh, ability to stop something or, or a clutch's ability to, um, to, to, to get to the other shaft uh, to rotate at the same speed. Um, so I don't necessarily want to belabor this right here, but, but I think the important thing to look at is they've made some kind of P U right here where U is a dimension. So it's the pressure is a function of U. And in this model right here, they're assuming that the pressure uh, uh, varies along, um, and it looks like it has some type of curvature to it, but, but what they've done instead in the model is they made like this sort of trapezoid type of thing to try to, uh, uh pressure distribution, um, that they've made this assumption in. Um, so here we go. Here's a list of the assumptions. Is the pressure at any point on the shoe is assumed to be proportional to the distance from the hinge point, right? This is a model. That's the big idea. And, um, there's other things that we are including in here, and the model ain't great, but the model has been shown uh, to be de good enough uh, for some applications. Um, if this was the space shuttle's brakes, right, as it's landing, and we don't really run the space shuttle much, but that, that had to have some incredibly well-designed brakes, right? So you might use a better model than this, but this is a good introduction for engineering students to see how um, a model can be employed, and we can get an answer to something, but also see some of the, um, some of the downsides to, to that model. And uh, I also think this is a good topic because we show some integration with uh, heat transfer class. So um, in here, we have uh, different scenarios that they're talking about with, we have a, a leftward movement of the floor where this thing is stationary instead uh, um, right here. So we could see, and, and one important thing we might want to find out in these calculations is also the pin forces, the pin reaction. Now, I don't have you calculating those um, because the, pr the problems get to be kind of long. And, but, but it would be something we would want to try to, as engineers, if we were trying to design the thing, to uh, figure out what the pin forces are going to be so that we could design what the diameter of the pins uh, are, will, will be, right? So to, to get the stresses in them. Um, here we see that the uh, the rightward motion uh, of the um, of the floor right here. If that was the case, I mean, you could kind of instead of the the floor moving, you could think of this as being a doorstop. You could think the door is is moving, and in that case, the door would be moving to the left as opposed to the floor moving to the right. And what you'll find. And, and the important thing is that then the, the direction of the motion actually helps the braking, 
right? Can you picture that? That like now, if the door was to going going to start moving in, of course, I think my camera goes the back, the other direction. Yeah, my camera goes the opposite direction from here, um, from the way that I would want to try to uh, present the thing. Yeah, uh, if if this thing is slide, if the if the floor were to start to slide and the door were stationary, it it would increase the breaking the, the breaking effect. Right, as opposed to the other direction right here. If the floor was moving outward this way, that would be like if the door was moving to the right instead. And this door stopper wouldn't do a whole lot. We get that idea. Um, I don't know if the one on the right has any uh, effect, but that, this is, you could read through the example, and this is just a, the, this is what the, 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 the takeaway that I was having for this. All right, so we go to uh, section 16.2, and we talk about the internal expanding rim clutch or break, all right? So this is your, your typical one where we have a, um, a drum on the outside rotating and we have a shoe on the inside. Now there's lots of arrows and so forth and, and these are, you're gonna have to try to uh, navigate through these. The best is to try to go through an example to try to explain them. But the one on the left, this one is gonna be a short shoe. Whoops, it's not gonna let me write on that, come on, yeah. This is the short shoe, right? And so the idea um, is that from the pin measured this way right here, this angle, the total angle up to uh, right here is gonna be less than 90 degrees. A long shoe as measured from the pin right here, this right here is greater than 90 degrees and therefore this is a long shoe. It's really hard to write this way. I should try to get better at it. Um, and the important distinction here is, again, the model, the pressure model right here. So this is what people get confused on, uh, students get confused on. So let's take a look. Okay, for a, this right here is the angle right here going that way as measured from the pin, right? So the pin's coming this way. So the angle is being measured that way right here. And what you see is theta one is where the pad begins, right? So uh, you have to look at this figure closely right here and you can see that the pad is starting right there. That's gonna be theta one. The angle from the pin to where the pad starts. So right here, all right? And then the pad stops at theta two right here. And you can see that it doesn't make it to right here. And that's going to be our 90 degrees right here. So what they're saying, what the, what the model is using is using a sine wave or a portion of a sine wave that goes from zero to pi. So pi is 180 degrees. So this is half a sine wave and that's the model that we're using. There's nothing magical about this model except that someone came up with it and tried it and put on some brakes and said, well, you know, the results that I get when I apply this uh, model of the pressure distribution seems to be pretty decent and repeatable. So that, so I think it's going to be, uh, um, as opposed, this could be parabolic instead of being sinusoidal. And I know that might look the same, but it's not exactly the same. Or we could try to do the trapezoidal one. Because remember back in here, this was a tra what their this example is a demonstration of a trapezoidal pressure distribution. And so that's all this is. And we're trying to decide how the pressure is distributed. And we have a designation of theta A. I don't know why they use a subscript A, but the A subscript A means max, right? So the maximum pressure occurs right here, right? Where at right there at the um, uh, uh, place of the shoe. And by, uh, um, by the way, uh, we're, we're, the maximum pressure is always going to be, I should mention, it's always going to be, um, uh, well, it's going to be dependent on the direction of rotation. Is that true? 
no, that's not true. I'm sorry. Um, in this case right here, the direction of it, it, I, I'll take that back. The direction of rotation is going to be important for something else. All right. But you can see here's the actuating force is going to be placed right there. So it's going to be far furthest away from the pin. That's what it is because the pin defines where zero is on here and you can see that um, because it's a short shoe it never makes it up to the 90 degrees where the peak of the sinusoidal wave would be now here on a short on a long shoe right here we see that we start to um, go up and then at nine the, okay so here is where theta one is right here and here's where the so this is where the the pad begins right here so the pad is this part right all in here that grayed out area uh, right in here. We could make it another color uh, to highlight it. Let's go for green where the mouse disappeared. This is exciting stuff, isn't it? Okay, yeah. So anyway, um, we'll come right in there. And there is the, um, that's where the pad material is. So it starts at theta one and it ends at theta two, which is actually where the end of the, uh, 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 the the shoe is as well. It didn't have to end at the sh end of the shoe. Um, and then there's also this is where the breaking of uh, uh, the uh, actuating force F is being applied. And we'll note that um, yeah, okay, note some things. But anyway, the maximum in this model, the sinusoidal model, occurs at 90 degrees right and and that just makes sense right here so somewhere in here when we come from this way uh so it's going to be right here right actually they're showing it right here and that's bad it should actually be right here right because that would this is actually 90 degrees to get up from there you could just tell by looking at the thing that that that's the location of 90 degrees and i'm not sure if i'm the maniac uh, who uh, uh, put that th that theta a in there years ago? I should probably fix it. I should take a look at the bo the book and see if that's their um, addition or if I did it. Now um, we're going to integrate some things across this face right here. Uh, it's necessary. Um, but we're going to see these forces that are applied. The other thing that we're going to care about in this geometry, that one of our big tasks, is to find this uh, uh, value of uh, C right here. It's going to be uh, a critical thing, and we're going to see this because we're going to need to use make a free body diagram uh, about and get the sum of the moments about the pin, and so the dimension of the uh, perpendicular distance of the actuating force to the pin right here, that, that's going to be an important dimension. Um, so here's one that they're showing, uh, uh, this is a, 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 an internal uh, expanding centrifugal acting rim clutch. Now what that can mean, the centrifugal acting is that the, the, the speed that this thing rotates can push those pads outwards and cause it to uh, engage. Right, so that's kind of a, a trick that you could actually play. So these things could be a lot more complicated, but you can kind of see what the, what, what the drum looks like and there's something attached over to the other side. So here's a condensed version of the derivation of the equations that we use for the uh, internal um, drum. I'll try not to belabor this too much. And once again, I'm acting as your tour guide to this. You will, um, at, hopefully after we go through this, you'll be able to walk through it yourself and kind of get your head around what's actually taking place. So um, here is the fundamental equation right here. This right here represents the pressure at as a function of theta, right? So if we were to superimpose uh, something along those lines right there, we have... Um, so if this was the pressure, um, it's coming like, maybe I go like that right there, okay? So if that was like um, lines representing a graph of uh, the pressure level and any the, the further the distance radially away was a uh, an indication of the magnitude of the pressure, the max pressure should be right here, 90 degrees from the pin. And uh, we, we note, so because remember, I think it's, did I put it down at the bottom here? I really should have put it down at the bottom. I was going to put uh, a repeat of the of um, th this graph right here. So we want to keep going back to this graph. It's probably 
This graph, no, no, the one that we're showing in this next page is a long shoe right here. So we have uh, this right here. So, so it kind of makes sense. I'll, I'll sketch what the what the graph looks like um, of this thing again. Right, is half a sinusoidal wave. Or right here, this is 180 degrees, and this is 90 degrees. And based on where theta one is, this is theta one, and this is theta two over here, something like this. So this right here that I've shown is really being superimposed up here uh, onto this thing. And this right here describes how that pressure is done. They're just saying here is the PA, the maximum, which occurs at theta A. And they have the sine right here divided by, and it's going to be multiplied by that sine. So that gets that distributed. And if we want to find, uh, so let me get rid of this thing that kind of like blocks the thing out here. If we want to find the normal force at any given spot, so the incremental normal force, it's going to be um, P times B, the pressure there, times B, which is the, um, uh, uh, which is going to be the width right that's going to be uh the, into the page so they use b uh for that quite often um in in the, these breaks and then r is the obviously the radius uh of the of the thing right so there's r right there um and d d theta is d theta because it's these it's a little arcs worth of area right so the r uh, d theta is actually uh, uh, time is going to be the arc length and b is going to be the width so that's going to be a little incremental area so that force is going to be the pressure times that incremental area so that's the incremental force and so we can substitute this pressure distribution that we have up above in for the for the p and now we have the maximum pressure times that and uh, but by the way, remember that the theta A is a physical location. So that is uh, quite often for a long shoe, theta A is going to be 90 degrees. For a short shoe, it's wherever the pad ends, right? So theta A, quite often, long shoe, it's going to be 90 degrees. Therefore, sine of theta A is one equal to 1. Uh, we want to find the moment of the friction forces right here. That moment of the friction forces is, is going to be... Um, the the thing that like balances out, right? So, uh, um, so the friction forces are all this guy right here. It's going to be, um, and it, well, shown here, it's going to be the coefficient of friction, which they oddly make this cursive lowercase f. That that times the um, uh, dn. Uh, but it's actually going to be times r minus a cosine of theta. It's because of the way uh, that this thing works out right here that um, uh, it, it, the the w the friction forces are going in one direction here. And uh, uh, let me see if I say that the right way. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, because we're going to integrate across that theta. And it's F, D, N. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So this is actually right here. The reason why this is that the moment arm is going to change, right? So the so we're, we're, we're taking a look at what the moment is going to be caused due to friction uh, about that point, right, about that pin. There's also going to be a moment due to the normal force, right? So if looking at these two forces right here, we have a for normal force, yes, that's going to, because uh, because we have an actuating force that's pushing this pad against this drum, but at each different little point, whatever point we're talking about right here, there's going to be a normal force of the drum pushing back against the pad. And then, but there's also, at each different little incremental point, there's going to be a friction force that's also creating a moment. And we're going to see that it's going to be, one really important thing is what direction direction does the thing rotate because that's going to change which direction the friction force is going to um, cause a moment right so what we could do is we could super we, we could substitute in uh, for this F uh, uh, for, for um, this guy right here right 
So we take and we say the, uh, well, maybe the, we didn't write it anywhere, but the friction force or D friction force, it's going to be equal to coefficient of friction dn, where n right here is going to be the incremental normal force. So we had the incremental normal force. We plug it in uh, uh, for uh, this f dn right in here, and we get this equation, which is 16-2. And we need to... Um, uh, we, we need to integrate it between theta 1 and theta 2. Because that's not known, this is the equation that we use. We do need to integrate um, those things. Now, for the uh, that, that's the moment due to the friction. But there's also a moment due to the normal forces, mn. And it has a different uh, moment, uh, 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 moment arm that it's fighting against. Uh, so that's going to be a times the sine of theta. Of course, it changes with each of the position. And where, by the way, that a is going to be the distance from the center to the pin, right? Which is not the same thing as r, right? R is the distance to the drum, out to the drum, right here. So um, yeah. And so if we uh, the equation sixteen three is Really just, um, I think it's just putting in, let me double check here. Yeah, it's putting the same thing in here. It's saying dn right here. It's substituting dn in for right here. And so now we have sine squared of theta. Um, and now if we want the torque, quite often that's the thing we care about. We, we, we want to stop this something, right? We're breaking. So we want to figure out what kind of torque is generated right here. That's going to be that friction force um, uh, 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 right here integrated across the entire surface of the drum right here. So uh, that's going to be F times dn, and then and we, we're going to do uh, all the way for R uh, to the thing. Well, actually, it's the, uh, we could say that it's the friction force, if we will, times R is what's going to be the torque, but this is incremental d uh, friction force. Therefore, we have F times R dn, where that little F is the coefficient of friction. And once again, we're superimposing this uh, normal force in into there. And if we do that, uh, we're able to get uh, this equation right here. We have the cosine of 1 minus the cosine of 2, just because we've integrated between theta 1 and theta 2 across the entire drum uh, brake pad. Um, and so, by the way, okay, so um, now, now th these two things, this, uh, th these two moments right here are... Um, are always true. But now the direction um, of the rotation is going to determine how they interact with the actuating force. And truth be told, they should really have done a free body diagram. And in order to decide uh, which, uh, you, you're going to see there's a, a, another equation that we, we need to choose between. And we ask about clockwise with its counterclockwise. It's not, you can't go to this equation and just use it blindly because it's the location of the pin matters, right? This equation is correct for a pin that's over on this side right here, but the pin could be, this thing could be a hundred, like completely flipped, right? It could be a mirror image of it, and now the pin could be on the left, right? And so you gotta be careful about which, now now the counterclockwise isn't, it, it is gonna be the uh, other way around. But, so, and you'll see why this is important in a minute. So what we really should have done is taken a free body diagram of the uh, shoe right here, and for the direction of rotation, which is clockwise right here, we're going to say now, remember, a free body diagram are the forces on the body. And we're doing the shoe. So the, sh so the drum is acting on, the, um, on this shoe. So the direction of the incremental forces are going to be such that they're going to um, be uh, uh, pushing this direction right here, right? All right, now, th instead of writing it as a force, we'll write it as a moment, right? But but it's actually a force, but we'll put that, this is the MF, is actually going in that direction. 
Now, the, the, the moment due to the normal force, now the normal force is the drum again, pushing back again onto the pad. So that means that the MN, right, the moment that's going to be because of that is going to go in this direction. Now we're also going to have uh, loads that are going to be applied um, because of this actuating force right here. So we have this actuating force that we just simply called F. And then we're also going to have reaction forces right here um, at the pin. So if we take the sum of the moments about that pin, uh, which they decided to call A, is equal to zero, what we find, um, and we're going to say that counterclockwise is posit positive, we get F, negative F times C, where C, uh, switch colors here, let's go orange, C is this distance, right? It's got to be a distance that's perpendicular to the forces. And I'm going to take making this video longer than it needs to be probably. And you could probably fast forward through some of this. But if you really want to understand it, you should watch the video. But I'm kind of going slower than I, I would have wanted to in class. Um, but I really want to try to explain it. And I know that students get confused by this. But anyway, so so that goes in the um, counterclockwise, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the clockwise direction, the F times C. Right now, the other ones we're going to treat these at, even though they're they're shown as forces, they're moments, right? So th we we see that the moment uh, about M N is also going to be clockwise, so it's also negative. But the moment due to F, you'll notice about that pin is going to be uh, counterclockwise, so it is um, so so it is uh, so it was cursive F, so it's going to be um, positive in here and we set these equal to zero and that's why we have this equation right up here right we reset the thing solve it for f divided by c and the critical part of this is that minus sign that minus sign has a purpose so the whole reason of like doing the free body diagram is just to get it straight is it a plus sign or a minus sign and that that's all dependent on the rotation because uh, this thing, even in this configuration as shown up above, could rotate in the other direction, even though with the pin in the same place and the rea and the the um, uh, uh, the actuating force in the same place, right? So, uh, in the special case of what would happen hypothetically if M N was equal to M F, what would happen right here? Well, F would be equal to zero, and what does that mean? That means there no force would be required to apply this for this thing to break, right? So in essence, what that means is going to be just like that doorstop with the door moving or the floor moving, right? In one direction, it's just going to break and it's going to, the, the more it breaks, the more breaking effort, you know, it's going to be fine, right? In the other direction, it's going to like skid, right? You would need to push down onto the doorstop in order for there to be effectively to stop it, for, stop the door from moving. But in the other direction, it kind of gets bound up. It binds, right? It's locking. So that's what we call self-locking. We have self-locking is attained and no actuating force is um, required. Now, these th two things don't have to be equal to each other. So MN is most often larger than MF. But what this means in this configuration is it helps, right? And now it might not be fully locking, but it assists the orientation of the rotation, assists in the braking. Right, so it'll still slide right there, but like it, this, it's going to take a lot less actuating force in this direction of rotation than it will if this thing has to rotate in the other direction. Um, also, what could be true, MF could be larger than FN, and say, what does that mean? You have a negative force. That means you'd need to pull it away. You need to to pull. So instead of pushing this within the direction shown, you'd need to pull back. Um, it, it's kind of weird because uh, you almost think of the thing moving away, but it's just we just have to release uh, a little bit right there. Um, 
it's a, it's a, it's this odd thing. So, but you rarely will see that. Most of the time, MN is greater than MF. Uh, so, like for the clockwise um, right here. Now, I don't require this. It's kind of a stupid thing because they 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 don't give our. Maybe they do, but anyway, the equation is really long and ugly. They give it for the reaction, the x direction, and in the y direction. You notice this a and this b. What is that? This is this integral down here that you need to do. So you, you would need to uh, do this. And like I said, uh, most of the time I care about the breaking torque right up here, which is something that we're going to calculate. Um, and we'll see why we need to do these uh, these other two things, this MF and this MN. Uh, we'll, we'll see that in a second, why we would care. Um, because you, know they, you notice they don't appear anywhere inside this equation. We'll see what the uh, uh, mechanics of this uh, solution. Um, so for counterclockwise direction right here, once again, they got this from the free body diagram of the shoe by itself. Um, and since both of the moments have the same sense, um, the self-energizing effect, which is another way of saying like uh, uh, the self-locking, self-energizing just means that it helps. Self-locking kind of means that it's like it'll just stop it on its own. Um, and uh, uh, so, but, this, but w in the other direction, you need an actuating force to be able to get it to stop. And they also have the uh, uh, different equations in here for those uh, reaction forces. Um, but once again, I don't usually ask for it just because it makes the problem too long. Um, I'll do the example in another video. And this is me going through all of it, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk our way through it here uh, after. But you can see it's a relatively long example, but we'll, we'll go in another video. Um, this is section 16.3. I usually don't ask questions uh, about this because we're, we do the internal break. It's, it, it's a very similar thing going on here. You can see that this is going to be a long shoe uh, because it extends greater than 90 degrees. And uh, our equation is very similar, if not the same. Actually, I, I haven't actually looked and seen if they're the same or not. It looks to be the same uh, equation for MF. And the equation for MN, they look to be the same. And for clockwise uh, direction, so for clockwise direction, you notice that this is a positive Whereas for clockwise direction, it was negative. So once again, it would be better than just trying to look up this equation just to double check with a free body diagram. And I require that when I'm doing exams and I ask for this kind of problem. You have to draw a free body diagram as part of it, um, just as I did it there, uh, to, to show that you understand the nature of the thing and are not just a an equation looker upper. And then this is the reaction forces if we wanted to find that. And that would be to design the pin right that's why we would want to find that and then we have uh, we get a different symbol or different sign for um, counterclockwise and I suspect yep sure enough we have the reactions going on here now um, a very typical uh, uh, external clutch or break um, okay so one of the ships I was on uh, probably a couple of ships. One in particular I know is the Falcon Duchess. Isn't that a beautiful name, the Falcon Duchess? Well, they had multiple um, engines and a single shaft. So uh, uh, and um, the, and those the the engines were connected uh, to a reduction gear that allowed them to uh, to both drive that single shaft. Um, but you needed the flexibility of decoupling those engines to that uh, reduction gear in case one of them broke, right? You didn't want to like turn the engine around if it's not able to go, you know, and you'd, you had the shafts hard connected to each other with couplings, you would, ro you would by necess necessity have to have the engine rotating and you don't want that. So, and also you'd like to run the engine without having to drive the propeller, right? So you need to get the engines warmed up while you're in port ready to go. So they have clutches and they actually had this kind of inflatable bladder right here type of thing and we knew that because it had well, I, I knew something of it I, or I mean I could have just looked it up right here but uh, we had pressure we, we had problems with the uh, air compressor and some of the controls some of the the pressure regulators uh, that were putting air into this bladder right here and it wasn't sufficient and all oh, the 
stench because you don't want these uh, uh, th th this thing rotating and having and and, and there being some friction uh, around this uh, uh, this large uh, mass this flywheel that it's rubbing up against and ah oh, that would stink to high heaven because it didn't have enough pressure it was slipping um, so that's an example of a uh, an application here where we have one thing that's rotating and we want to couple it with another and we want a flexibility of what um, gets connected to another. But yeah, I remember that like it was yesterday. It was, I remember it. you don't forget the smell of burning uh, uh, brake pads or clutches. They stink. All right. So there's an example we'll do and also in a separate video. Um, we'll go through this. So don't look. Ruin the surprise. And um, okay, so that's uh, it for uh, uh, class 15. I'll pick it up at class 16 uh, in another video. Thank you for paying attention. Oh, and should we play a little guitar um, at the end of each of these? Why not? Okay, so um, I can't recall what I put on, on any of the other videos. I don't think um, this is my... Uh, uh, oh, I think we did this. We, we showed off the Les Paul, but this is my um, beautiful... Uh, this, this Les Paul features some uh, pulse switches, let's see, uh, that uh, turn off uh, a, a couple things and tone circuits and that kind of thing. But... Um, I don't know what uh, uh, setting I have on uh, the fake amplifier. Thing. the dust here no i don't know that song it's a good song though i gotta play bass on the next one here there you go uh 46 minutes there ain't nobody watching it